Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Graham Hambly. I'm the editor of PQ Magazine. And together with the Shani, we decided we should look at the future of audit. Um, some people thought that was madness. We didn't, of course. Um, I, I thought one of the things I should do is, is uh, I'm sure you're all st a lot of you are studying audit at the moment, I know, at the university. Hopefully some of you have looked at the Biden report. It's quite a big report about audit. And the great thing about the Biden report, if you go all the way to the back to Annex 9, it has a poem about auditing. Now, my favourite poet is Benjamin Sevenaya. Um, he's from Brum, um, and he does a fantastic poem about turkeys. Do look it up. It's, it's so wonderful. But this poem is all about audit. So it's called The Accountant's Report. We have audited the balance sheet, and here is our report. The cash is overstated, the cashier being short. The customer's receivables are very much past due, and if there's any good ones, they are very, very few. The inventories are out of date and practically junk, and the method of their pricing is very largely bunk. According to our figures, the enterprise is wrecked, but subject to these comments, the balance sheet's correct. Now that poem, thank you, well I've done as well as my Benjamin, and that poem was taken from a 1951 edition of Accounting Review, and I think it originated in the 1930s. So people's criticisms of audit haven't really changed. But I think audit has an incredibly difficult job to do. But a really important one. And um, I, I also picked up the, the president, uh, not the president, the CEO of the ICAW was recently in City AM. Um, and there's a real problem because there are massive reform, reforms of audit about to happen. But um, the government has been distracted by COVID and other stuff. But it's really important for UK PLC to get this sorted and to have audit back on track and, and looking fit for purpose. So I think audit's really sexy, sexy subject. Thank you, Ishani. And I, I think it's a really important subject. So without further ado, that's all you're going to get from me. I'm going to hand you over to Ishani. Thank you, Graham. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Graham. So welcome you all to Queen Mary, University of London. Thank you so much for coming tonight, joining this very important seminar series, industry speaker series, actually. We started this series last semester with a tax panel, and it was very successful. So we thought we might also organize an audit. And there's importance to this from an education perspective for Queen Mary, that um, we are one of the only schools, School of Business and Management, um, teachers here at Queen Mary Accounting, specialised subject, financial accounting, management accounting, audit, tax, all of those subjects. And in the audience today, we have students from three undergraduate programmes, BSc Accounting and Management, BSc Accounting and Finance, and BSc Accountancy with PwC. Um, so we, we are very, this is a privilege um, to, to have you all today here. Thank you for joining students. And then we also have um, our staff members, those who are leading the conversation, leading the teaching, and I'm really f um, feel grateful to for of, I'm very grateful to you all for um, taking time to attend tonight. So we have all our accounting and financial management um, team members here as well tonight. And then we have um, our external speakers. Thank you very much for joining us today. I will introduce all of you in a minute. Um, and uh, this event is supported by ACCL, CIFRA, and ICAW. I've just seen Sean is walking in. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, thank you for supporting us um, to lead this very special um, panel today. So um, our panel, as I said, I'm, I'm Ishani. I'm Program Director for BSc uh, Flying Start with PwC, and I'm a reader in accounting. I joined Queen Mary 15 years ago. 
and um, it was at the time I was a lecturer. Um, though I think I was a teaching assistant, uh, Joan Queen Mary, and a lecturer. So I made you know kind of went um, my way through in this journey. And um, I myself has a you know story to tell, but you all know about that already. And um, my passion is for accounting education is is I cannot tell you what plans we've got on the table and um, what plans we have for our students as well and all these panel members know and that's why they are here to inspire you. Um, and I hope you enjoy this event. I, uh, I don't want to take too long, too much time, but um, uh, after we finish the panel, we will have a um, um, question and answers round as well. So hopefully that will give you an opportunity to ask questions, also share with your thoughts your experience, etc., with the panel members. So for now, without further ado, may I introduce our first panel speaker, Jonathan Lambert from PwC. Jonathan is our partner sponsor for the Flying Start program. Thank you for joining us tonight, Joss. Um, then we have our second, it's okay. Then we have our second panel member, Yogi Staka from FCCA. Um, Senior Technical Advice Manager Yogesh um, is very kind to join us tonight and he's also a qualified chartered accountant and he'll tell about his journey in a minute. And then we have the third panel member, John Bolton, Director Policy at ICAW. And we've got the fourth panel member, Ian Murray, Director of Public Financial Management from CIFA. And our fifth panel member, our very own Sultana Asmi, who's at National Audit, one of our, uh, our alum. One of the first graduates went from one of these programs to uh, do ICAW um, qualific professional qualification. We have six panel member, Vivek Chain, head of audit. Um, it was Lloyds Banking Group, exactly. Thank you, Vivek, for uh, coming to, um, uh, to the panel tonight. And it's a busy panel, so we won't take much time because there's lots to tell and also share as well. And at the end, as I said, a question round for you all. So, Jonathan. This is for you and thanks to Johnny and obviously I can't follow instructions so I could have been sitting down here before so I came up slightly early so but thank you Shani and uh, just to introduce myself again I know I've got my students at the at the top but I'm John Lambert I'm a partner at PwC in London and I'm proud about two things tonight uh, I'm proudly the sponsor of the Flying Start program uh, at Queen Mary's um, I'm very I'm very happy to be here I'm also proudly an auditor um, and actually, when uh, when when you are an auditor, that is quite a difficult thing to get your head around. But I am very proud to be an auditor and to say that I'm an auditor. Um, I haven't got really much of a prepared speech, but all I wanted to do is just give you a bit of background about me and how I got to be here today, um, and then give you my high-level views on on where I think my profession and I hopefully my students' professions going going to to end up. Um, I think if I was you, this would be probably about 1995, probably most, most of you weren't born here uh, then. Um, and I was thinking about what I might do um, as a career. And my dad said I'd become a lawyer and accountant because everyone who's successful tends to be a lawyer and accountant. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So similar to what it was out here, Coopers and Lybrand at the time did a wonderful thing called a milk round. And they came around to the University of, of Durham where I was um, and they offered me free, free food and alcohol. So I went to see what auditing was all about um, and another three years uh, of education, which I thought that would defer the decision. So I was only going to join and get my ACA, get it, and then I was going to do something else in my, my career. Um, but in Jan on January the 5th of this year, I celebrated 25 years at the firm. And the only thing I've done longer is go out with my wife, who I met at Durham University. Um, so I'm here 25 years. 25 years later, I've been a partner. This is my 12th year as a partner. Um, and I've been in audit for all, all that time. Um, the, the things I, I think, I don't know if you've seen the adverts about joining the army and see the world, or well, I joined auditing and I've seen the world. I've been over to over 20 different countries. I was, I was going through my, you know, on the phone when you can see it in the, in the maps where you've been. So I'll sort of take photos of where I've been. So 20 different countries. I've audited cigarette manufacturers. Uh, I've audited beer companies. I've, I've ordered other companies that, that have vices, um, Vodafone, um, I'm currently the audit partner on IT. Uh, so I signed that last week.
Association, where I'm their audit partner. Um, I think I was chosen because I'm not really into tennis, so I'm very, very independent. Um, I also audit the, the National Lottery operator, Camelot. So I've got a, a variety of different clients. And one of the great things about being an auditor is you do get to see so many different businesses and get under the skin of it. It's actually illegal to lie to an auditor as well. And I do tell my kids that, but, um, but they, they don't perhaps listen, listen as much. So, um, so look, when I started, um, it was very different. Audit was very different. It was all very much focused on the financial information at the back of the accounts. I always call it the, the back half of the accounts. So it's all the numbers, the, the P&L and the balance sheet uh, that, and the cash flow that, that was referenced in, in the poem before. Um, if you were king or queen in the audit room, it's because you had a pencil case that had Tipex in it. And you probably don't know what Tipex is, but we had paper files. And when you made your mistake, you had to put Tipex in. If you had the, the stuff that was like the tape you put over, you were, you know, number one. So um, we had paper files. There wasn't laptops when I first started. I'm not that old, but um, didn't have laptops. Um, when we did have laptops, um, you had to get your a lead and plug it into the fax machine to then dial in back to the office to replicate your file. So it was all, it was all quite antiquated, um, but it's surrounded by brilliant people. And that's one thing I'll come back to. People are really, really important and teams and audit teams are incredibly important. Um, and that's one of the things that's kept me in the profession for, for 25 years. Um, so that's what it was like. I've had a, a fantastic career, but as I said, things have changed. Um, and there's a lot more focus on our profession than there was 25 years ago. Um, and when you hear about corporate collapses, the first question is, and where were the auditors? There's, there's, there's more pressure on what we do. I used to say I'm an accountant and to my friends or dinner parties or wherever it might be. And, and this person said, oh, can you help me with my tax return? Um, I'm not an accountant, I'm an auditor. And that's one of the changes that's happened. And the specialism of what it means to be an auditor has become into much sharper focus nowadays. Um, and look, some of you may not know what, okay, and you can learn, but basically it's checking stuff. And therefore what I want to talk about is the nature of audit and what needs to be checked. So where I think the profession is going, and hopefully this leads in some of the conversations, I think it's going to be technology and late enabled human-led though and it's really important it's human-led and finally it's going to be broader than it was so if you think about where we are in society at the moment i think trust is in very short supply it's a very valuable commodity but in really short supply. when express the firm's view people are, don't seem to trust the government at the moment media but people trust business and we did a, a survey of all the big C out there by companies is trusted. It is trusted even more if it's been audited or assured. And I use auditing and assurance uh, inter interchangeably. So if it's been checked by someone independent, like, such as myself, people trust the information. Where also I think the, the world is going, is it, we talked about the back half and the, and the numbers in, in the accounts. Um, stakeholders aren't just shareholders anymore it's not just people investing in companies it's employees it's suppliers it's society more general i mean more, more generally um, and therefore companies are producing more information because their stakeholders demand it and actually the information that goes there and and making sure that information is is correct and accurate in a world in a world gives you license to operate gives you access to capital Actually, as a firm, and as, as, as you as a generation, I'll call you a generation, I think I'm, I worked out, I'm, I think I'm generation X. Um, there's a Y and a Z, and, and generation A is coming. But actually, we're a multi-generational firm. Um, I'm, I'm one of the, I think, 5%, but there's 55% who are young. 25% of our workforce is, is new each year. Um, so... Ninety-five. my determination was and were they giving free beer now you'll say and what's your net zero commitment what's your diversity policy what's your inclusion policy how green is your office how 
open eye and transparent are you about what you do and, and how you how you do it? And as an organization, in order for us to be competitive, in order, in order for business to be competitive, you have to state what you do and you have to be held accountable to what you do because you won't recruit the very best. And we want to recruit the very best unless you're doing the very best. And so in order to assure and to create trust in society, we have to be trusted ourselves as organizations. So if you think about the annual report, that I signed the ITV annual report last week, I think it was 248 pages long. The, the numbers were a bit at the back. There was an awful lot of information about people. If you think the ITV have gone through the Jeremy Carl show um, incidents about duty of care to their, to their staff and to the people who are on their shows and also their own employees. There's a lot of people information out there. There's also a lot of ESG, we call it, information so about greenhouse gas emission if you look at every single bit of accounts now they talk about people's net zero commitments and that don't have friends with the app for it's good good but they spend a lot of money on that so actually their monthly average users is a really important non-financial piece of information so where i think the profession is going is the broadening of assurance as an audit partner, I'm very much focused on the back end of the, or the back half of the accounts. As an audit partner, I need to be much more open-minded and we as a firm need to start thinking about assuring the non-financial numbers. So anything in the annual report that goes to stakeholders is in there because it's important. And if it's important, it needs to be trusted. To be trusted, it needs to be audited or assured. And that's where I think fundamentally the, the profession is going, is the broadening of assurance. Technology will come with that. And I'm sure my other panel members will talk about technology. Technology is brilliant. And I need your generation because I'll tell you a little anecdote. When the guy comes around to put Sky TV in, and I'm speaking to a few Sky engineers, and don't worry, I do go off tangents sometimes. When they get the, the controller, they give it to the youngest person in the house. They don't give it to the old fuddy daddy like me because you're, it's part of your DNA. Again, I was plugging leads into a fax machine. You know how to communicate in a virtual world, in a hybrid world. You're used to dealing with emails. I'm still, let's pick up the phone. But you're, you can swipe left or right. You can do whatever you, you do on technology. And you're very happy for interacting with technology. It's, it's a very safe place for you. It's more of a learning curve for me. And technology is going to be the heart of what we do. And where technology will sit is providing efficiency, but also providing greater assurance. The model I talked about 25 years ago was taking 250 samples and ticking it through, tool called tickers and bashers and bean counters. Technology, artificial intelligence is going to do that for us. And, and that what I need from your generation and you coming through is your ability to interpret that data and then talk back to someone about what does that mean. But actually, we're going to move on a, on a, on a spectrum of great assurance. So not just 250 samples, you can go end to end so for an ITV, for example, advert to cash for the advertising revenue, almost to 100%, and we use technology to do that. We look at journals that people post and look at patterns and use AI to look at the, and really zero in on the things that look unusual. And that makes auditing much more interesting than it was in my day. My day was about who got the best pencil case and who had the best lined pads to look at. But future, you're going to be pointed directly by technology to where the issues are, where the anomalies are. And that's what you're going to talk to your clients about. And you say, did you know that you've got that there? And that's really unusual. And just an anecdote that we, we, we used on one of my clients is we were able to look at a pattern of behavior in a shared service center in, in India, where the person in the shared service center, we could tell, came to work about 10 o'clock each day, started posting journals about 10 o'clock, stopped around 11.30 for probably a cup of tea and a biscuit, as we all do, had a, had a lunch break, had a, had a bit of a, a pattern and kept working during the afternoon and finished around 4.30. And that pattern went every day for a year, except one day when they posted a journal at 10 o'clock at night. And the technology zeroed in on that journal, and that's the one we go and test. So it's going to be a lot more interesting, a lot more involved, and you're going to have a lot more conversations. And the really important part of it, and I've mentioned it before, is the human-led. Technology is great. But that face-to-face -face interaction is so important. And what I would say to you is, and I always encourage you, and I know I said this to you when I met my students before, is you've got to learn how to talk to people. 
auditing is great because you extract information from people. And I said, they can't lie to you and you have a right to be there. And audit is open to all those different companies I talked about. But your ability to say to work on become very natural to you. But also learn how to talk to people about those exceptions. I always say to my, my clients, I want you to be a better organization having been audited by PwC. And we're going to use the technology, but most importantly, the people and the way that you audit will make the difference and will make us as a firm, I think, more competitive and, and, the, and the audit firm of choice because of the people we employ. I think I've probably taken too much time and I can talk phrases, but happy to take questions when we get to the end. But thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me today. <laughs> May I call you Gesh next, please? Thank you. Thank you, Gesh. Thank you, Shani. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I think that, that was a great um, introduction from um, Jonathan. And uh, obviously, um, you might hear a few little bits uh, from everybody that might start, start sounding a little bit repetitive because we're all kind of talking uh, on the same sort of subject. Uh, but hopefully we can try and provide different views. Uh, um, just a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in Kenya uh, and uh, I started working there um, in practice initially. Um, I did a little bit of internal audit as well as external audit. And you hear later on from Vivek who's going to be talking a little bit more about internal audit, whereas I think majority of us are going to be speaking about the external audit side of things. Um, so, you know, at the start of my career, which was now probably about 25 years ago, so just like uh, John here, um, it, it's, you know, it, it was very different. It will, you know, we had a different kind of uh, culture to audit. The clients themselves, the way they treated auditors was completely different. Uh, my experience uh, back then was that they, they actually feared auditors, you know, they revered auditors. And uh, when we walked into any client's premises as auditors with our big briefcase full of our um, last year's audit files, you know, um, the staff members were basically instructed by the owners or directors of the firms that they cannot speak to the auditors without clearing it out with, with the owner managers. So it, it was completely, you know, different in the sense that, yeah, they actually really revered us. Uh, I hope that things have stayed the same here, but when I came into the UK, uh, my experience was slightly different, uh, but I'm not going to tell you too much about that. I don't want to point you off body things. <laughs> so I, I leave that out. Uh, but basically, you know, there's probably a few uh, myths around auditing that uh, kind of uh, out there in terms of the general public uh, and probably those who actually are learning and training to be auditors. Um, so some of those myths are probably uh, something like um, auditors are there to just catch fraud, basically. Um, so that's, that's not the whole and sole purpose of auditing. Um, auditing is simply a, 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 an assurance of a certain level of uh, the information contained in the financial statements uh, at a reasonable level that you can be certain that it's free from material misstatement. And you will obviously learn about all those technical terms, material misstatement, meaning that, you know, there's a certain level of um, criteria of a uh, level of information that you did. There's errors in them. But by and large, the majority of it is correct. So it, auditing is not simply about, you know, catching fraud. There's a lot more to it. Um, the other myth about um, auditing probably is that auditors are simply there um, just to follow accounting standards. Um, again, you know, that's, that's a complete myth. You know, there's obviously ethical guidelines. There's the accounting standards, the auditing standards that you actually follow that the, the the auditing programs that you will be following as part of your audit training and and part of the audit job itself but you know all that is is just tools to enable you to do your job and you know like it was mentioned 
Um, there is technology which will help you to do that because, you know, when you're auditing bigger companies, there's so much data. Uh, and we mentioned that it's not about catching fraud, uh, you know, at, at that 100% level. You know, one of the other myths is that when you go into an audit, you're actually auditing 100% of all the information that you're given. Uh, again, that's not true. You 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 are assessing on a risk basis how much of that information is likely to be um, true or not true, and therefore you're providing some sort of a reasonable assurance to whoever is the uh, reader of those financial statements that um, it's been checked to a reasonable degree that you can be assured that it's true. Uh, of course, there are failures. You know, we have all heard about the you know uh, audits failures that uh, you know, have been in the public eye. And again, that's where, you know, that trust, the public trust comes into it. Um, but, you know, with, with all these tools and everything, you know, it, it's the element of professional judgment. Um, and then, you know, that's the human element uh, that will be finally the bit that you actually need to be um, very strong at because there are ethical guidelines around what you can and cannot do in terms of an audit. Uh, and the mention about the communication skills, you know, it's it's not about just communicating virtually. It is about communicating with your clients quite strongly on those ethical principles because you cannot compromise on those ethical principles. Otherwise, the audit will not be of an assurance level that you can be, you know, uh, you can put your name to it, you know. So that is something that you will have to learn as you go, but also be strong at that because, you know, at the heart of the audit is that ethical requirement that it needs to be correct. Um, obviously, the other myth is a boring job, you know, routine job, you know, it was mentioned in, in terms of uh, tick box exercise and all that, you know, it, it some parts of it can be boring at times, you know, but the excitement, I think, comes from, like, you know, it was visiting all these different clients, the different industries that you come across. Again, the different types of auditing, internal and external auditing, that you will hear a little bit more about as well. So there's a wide scope of auditing work um, that you will come across. Um, the scope, as you've seen, you know, has been uh, expanded a lot. It's not simply just assurance on financial statements. It is now going beyond that, you know, with the, for example, the, you know, uh, sustainability and uh, green assurance um, uh, elements coming in, the ESG reporting, uh, environmental sustainability and governance reporting. Um, so obviously a lot of businesses these days just jump on the bandwagon of the green revolution or we are green, we do this and that and all that. Uh, and that is where you will need to, as the future auditors, um, be able to exercise that level of skepticism that is required of the auditor um, to say, hang on, is this correct or not correct? Because ultimately, you want to also make that um, kind of almost moral decision uh, for the public good, that whatever is in that um, set of financial statements, including the financial elements, the balance sheet, profit and loss and all that, but also the non-financial bits, how it is governed, whether it is really truly sustainable or not, what is it, it is doing for the community, for example, um, all that information needs to be, uh, you know, um, true and reliable as well, because again, it was mentioned, you know, stakeholders now are a wide range of um, people, it's not just whoever is, is actually being audited, you know, there's the employees, there's the government. It, it, there's a wider public interest, obviously at the very, very large scale of audits, you know, the, the larger you go, there's a wider public interest to it. Uh, but even at the smaller level, um, it is really surprising that actually at the smallest level of, uh, of accounts and auditing, how important it can be to those who are part of the readers or, or users of those financial statements. Um, and, and sort of one of the myths there, you know, is, is the terms of the, uh, the, the misuse or, or misunderstanding of the term auditing. 
Uh, you know, it is it's sometimes very loosely used. Um, so there's there's a little bit of an uh, a knowledge gap between what um, auditors are supposed to do and what they actually do. With combined with that, there is an expectation gap between the public as to what they think auditors do versus what they want auditors to be actually doing. So part of your 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 role will be to you know fulfill that expectation gap as well uh, in in explaining to clients and users etc of what it actually means uh, for something to be audited like i mentioned it's not a hundred percent check of everything it's not about catching fraud in each and every instance but you know it has to be at a reasonable level of uh, assurance that you can then be sure that you can place that on that financial statements um, so that kind of, you know, uh, brings us to why this whole reform element is needed. Obviously, the government is working at developing this new set of rules, uh, a new uh, independent regulator called the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority, ARGA for short, is, is you know, is being developed. There's been delays to that. There's obviously been a huge lot of uh uh, public outcry over the recent failures of large audits. So that is where it's all coming from. Um, and yeah, you know, our call obviously is to get that in place as soon as possible um, so that the public confidence level can be put back on track. You know, now even if you, whether you go into audit or not, you know, if you are within the accountancy field, um, you will come across other government departments like HMRC and you will find, you know, even there, the level of trust between HMRC and the public is severely lacking. HMRC service levels have recently completely um, dropped to a level where they are completely unacceptable to the profession. So there's huge gaps there that, you know, as accountants and auditors that you will need to fill between the public and, you know, the uh, government and the other organizations that use all this information. Um, what about um, other things like emerging threats, global threats? You know, we've, we've seen obviously with uh, uh, the attack from Russia on Ukraine, um, government has to quickly come, uh, come up with uh, sanctions against uh, these sort of countries. And within those sanctions, and there are also financial elements. Um, so initially, you know, last year that they had banned um, accountancy services provision to any clients who were based in Russia and now that has been extended also to auditing as well so you cannot audit it uh, you cannot provide auditing services to any clients uh, based in Russia so the the point of all that is that you know it's auditing is a very evolving and agile profession and it needs to be really quickly moving to all these different elements that you know you come across the covid element that you know we've seen um technology was mentioned in terms of uh how do you use technology to do remote audits um i remember you know in, in one of my first jobs as an auditor um i was sent to cardiff to do a stock take um on the 31st of december because that was the year end and how brilliant it would have been if we had drawn technology then and I could have just sent a drone over to Cardiff and saved myself a trip to Cardiff. But in the end, it actually worked out fine because the auditor took me out for a night out and, and I actually enjoyed that. So, you know, it's not all about just doing that bookkeeping and doing the stock counting and all that. You've got to also have the fun element into it. Um, resilience. Well, how is resilience coming into it? Uh, like to say, you know, it, it's the scope of audit is widening to all these other elements um and that's where i mean you know the, the future lies in 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 making sure that all those other elements are covered in an audit um they're not just financial um information um there is a huge need for communication skills like i mentioned earlier um your your ability to talk about the findings of your audit with your client and to make them understand what um, impact that will have on the financial statements. Um, that is the key element of the communication skill. So whilst, you know, you have all these technological skills and tools to help you communicate 
um, virtually, that's part. That's only part of that communication. The, the real communication piece will come, as I say, with with that ethical element and your ability to, um, you know, stand your ground with those ethical principles. Uh, because ultimately, if that's not there within the audit, um, it, it's a meaningless audit. Um, that's where resilience will come into it. Um, the demand there is, you know, there's more demand, more and more demand for uh, proactive and forward-looking auditing. So auditing, obviously, in the past has always been about looking at a set of financial statements that are historic. You know, you've got your year-end, like I said, 31st December, for example, and you'd go and audit those financial statements a few months later and say, yes, information up to that date was fine. But the public interest now is 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 forward-looking. You know, companies, they, they, what they want information about where these companies are going to be in the future and how effective are they going to be uh, in the future, whether they're going to be still around in the future. Um, so that element now is coming into auditing. So that's the exciting bit that it's not about just auditing a set of historical files that, you know, you're given. Um, it's about using your judgment um, and, and forecasting abilities. Uh, again, you will have tools, technological tools, etc., to help you with all that. But the heart of it is, is that human element, the judgment element, that your professional um, skepticism will come into it to say everything that you've been told, um, you cannot simply just trust. You've got to um, test it out. You've got to make sure that it is correct. Um, so you've got to look at everything with a little bit of skepticism when it's presented to you uh, because you've got to put your name down on that audit report at the end of the day. So that's how, you know, the resilience element will come from where it's going in the future is to say, you know, we want a forward thinking auditing um, element to it, not a backward looking element to it. Um, so that's, that's, you know, like I said, that will be your skepticism coming into it. Um, we've already mentioned, you know, the greenwashing and, you know, um, of the of the environmental reporting, you know that is that is something that you have to make sure that you know there is there's a lot of um, um, sort of moral um, you know need you know there's the people are quite emotional about the whole sustainability issue you know so that, that there's a big big um, group of people that you have to actually please when you you know sign off an audit report. Um, so that is that is come into play. You know, it's it's not about just following a program or following a set of accounting or auditing guidelines. It's about using that judgment, and that's where the exciting element comes. But that's also a challenging element. You know, it is is not ethical. You know, decisions are not the easiest decisions. But that is where you know the challenge comes in, and that is where the excitement comes in. That you, you are making, you know, very very important decisions on those sets of financial statements and other bits of information that you're signing off on. Um, so future opportunities, you know, it's 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 a global um, requirement. Every country has its own auditing rules. Um, so it, it's it's one of those skill sets as as a, a specialist uh, within the accountancy profession uh, that you will gain, and you know it's something that you will be able to use throughout the world. You know, so it's it's an easily transferable skill. You know, the world is now a very small place, um, and if you've got opportunities to travel elsewhere and work elsewhere, you know, this is something that you will be really. Um, have an advantage over that because you know this is something that is easily globally um, transferable. So that is that is obviously where you know the future is 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 exciting for audit because of the huge scope of audit, um, the level of uh, assurance that the wider group of uh, stakeholders now require. Um, so you know there's there's it is. It, it is by no means a boring job, you know, that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. And hopefully, you know, I've been able to communicate that to you. Um, but so, yeah, uh, finally, what I would say is that actually the future of audit is in your hands. It's the future generation's hands. 
um, sort of just borrow a line from Back to the Future. The future is in your hands, so make it a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have John Bolton from ICAW. Thank you. All right, so I've got some slides for you today. So I'm going to do a little bit of a technical bit about where Audit is heading, but don't worry, don't fall asleep. It's only going to be 10 minutes and this will be useful for you for your exams. Hopefully it will be useful for you for interviews. You may have to know a little bit of background about where the profession's headed. It might even help you to think about where you might want to go in the profession because it's never been a better time to think about different areas and different things that a profession, a career in audit can help unlock for you. So I'm John Bolton. I'm the policy director at ICAEW. It does bring back some memories to me uh, being here tonight because I was a student uh, on the BA accounting and finance course 20 years ago, I think. And so I was sitting where you were sitting, listening to exactly these kinds of presentations, which uh, encouraged me to have a career in uh, trusted accountancy. So I was an auditor. I trained at PwC five years in audit, and then I became a preparer. It's what, what we call people who go inside companies to prepare the financial statement. So I did that uh, for a listed company. And then I worked as an analyst. So analyzing the financial reporting that companies do. So I've, I've seen this from all sides of the, uh, the coin as it were, and now at ICAW. So, as I say, hopefully this will be useful to you uh, in thinking about where your careers might go. So what I'm going to talk about is where the audit reforms are heading. What does audit look like in the UK? The UK government has been very ambitious in resetting audit following the failure of Carillion in 2018. This was a big FTSE listed company that went, uh, that, that went bankrupt. And it took with it a lot of small suppliers. It was a construction company, so many of its suppliers were very small. That led to public outcry uh, about that. And it had lots of public contracts that it was working on, including a number of hospitals. So that led to uh, some real public concern. Series of reviews, free reviews, public reviews were commissioned. And then the government reported back. The point of this slide, which you probably can't read, um, but we'll come back to these things in a minute. What's but there were a lot of recommendations in this report. And the UK government were very ambitious in trying to take a lead in audit reform. And we'll see where that's got to uh, in a minute. So new regulator, you may have heard of a financial reporting council, the current regulator for larger audits in particular and corporate reporting. The new regulator going to be established in law the main thing that's changing there is that this is a regulator that's going to have powers to sanction directors. It has increased oversight over audit in a number of areas, but it's going to be able to um, bring um, enforcement action against all directors. At the moment, the regulator cannot do that. It can only bring enforcement using its powers under the accountancy and other schemes against members of professional bodies. So this is, this is something that... Um, we feel will make a real difference. It will require primary legislation. Government has not laid that legislation yet. We think it's being drafted. Is it ever going to see the light of day? Perhaps it needs to wait until the next government comes in, just my personal view. Um, but you may see more of this in your uh, exam syllabus. Changes for auditors. Proposal from the UK government, a novel idea, managed shared audit. If you've uh, looked across uh, Europe, you might know that France has joint audit. This was influential in the UK, the idea you have two auditors. Apparently we used to have this in the UK years ago, but for regulatory reasons, it became less popular. There are very few joint audits in the UK uh, now, but in France, it's a statutory requirement. UK government looking to bring in what they call managed shared audit. It's a novel idea that the regulator has kind of come up with to, um, involve a second firm on a meaningful part of the audit. So this is something that you very well may encounter 
during your career is the idea that you don't only have one auditor, you have another auditor involved. Clearly, there will be lots of opportunities um, if that comes to, to pass. What may be more likely uh, is that the regulator of the FRC already taking on a competition remit, looking at the um, level of, of competition and market for FTSE 350 audits in particular. And what happens there um, may be driven by market dynamics. Um, we're already seeing um, an increasing number of challenger firms taking up audits in the FTSE 350. What the regulator does next, whether it's ever going to get statutory powers to introduce managed shared audit, which was a, a kind of UK specific idea, remains to be uh, remains to be seen. But there is operational separation, voluntary operational separation of the audit practice uh, of the of the largest firm. So that is very much underway. Um, so you may see more of that on your on your syllabuses. Um, <clears throat> And some ambitious changes around the, the role that auditors that auditors play. So, what's the new regulator going to do? So, the new uh, audit reporting and governance authority is going to have power to restate accounts without going to court. So, this is a big deal. At the moment, it has to go through a convoluted procedure to get companies to change their accounts if they if they believe they're wrong. It's going to be much easier for them to do that. So, with those additional powers, the idea is modelled on the SEC in the US, but the regulator is going to have much more clout with companies to encourage them to change their accounts and perhaps pay more attention to, to corporate reporting. As I say, sanctioning directors and setting requirements for audit committees. So we may see audit committee standards. I don't know if any of you aspire to being audit committee members. That's something with a career in audit, you may well be able to do in the future. Audit committee chair, uh, great opportunities. There are many organisations that have audit committees in the, in the public sector in particular, and that's a great career route that you can um, you can take in the, in the future. We're also looking forward to a stronger regime for corporate governance. I don't know if you've covered corporate governance, but this is about how companies manage and control the process around the, the, the board and what the directors do, how they're, they're kind of held to account and how the accounts are, are controlled. So in the United States, you may have heard about the Enron failure back in 2002, I think right at the beginning of my career. We certainly, it was just after I graduated, I think, but Enron was a big utility company that had gone into almost like a market maker for uh, energy. They failed. It was a big scandal in the US. There was massive reforms there, set up a new audit regulator, very much like what the UK is now trying to do. And they set up a internal control effectiveness regime. They required the auditors to look at the internal controls and report on that. The UK government was interested in introducing that in the UK, but after feedback, it seems that they've cooled on that idea. But from an audit perspective, this is absolutely crucial because if there's one thing that makes the job of auditor easier and less risky, is having a client that has strong internal controls. So we were very much looking forward to this coming in. There being real change, real focus from the largest businesses in making sure their internal controls were effective and that the reporting that they did was accurate. Now, this, of course, is also very important in the context of sustainability, because we're all worried about greenwashing. How do we make sure companies really are green? How do we make sure that what they're reporting on, some of the sustainability information that we're expecting to come is going to be quite hard to gather. It's going to require new systems, going to require education for people who do it. I mean, many of you may, may need to do this in the future. So there's a lot to learn. We're not scientists as auditors, but we have skills in understanding how to ask the right questions, understanding how to interrogate information. Those things are really important in the context of sustainability. But if companies don't have proper controls, then the information isn't going to be of high enough quality to audit. There's a lot of momentum behind the review. We've had the uh, Sir Donald Bryden and Sir John Kingman, who were the, the people who carried out these independent reviews. They're very clear that government needs to act and there's a lot of momentum. A lot of people have commented that reform is needed. 
But at the same time, there's also a level of inertia. There is a question of perhaps these UK reforms in the wider global context might be a little bit ambitious. But the IOD, the Investors Association, it's not just the accountancy profession saying reform is needed. Actually, the IOD saw real value in a more effective internal control. The Investors Association also see real value in getting these reforms done. So we may see within, I mean, it, it's going to be in several years' time before anything really substantive comes into play. But during your careers, you may see real reform and real change, which will shift what your what your careers look like but we also wonder whether actually we're looking at yesterday's problems because the uk another novel proposal that was put on the table is this idea that companies will publish an audit insurance policy that would require them to look at the scope of their audit does the audit go far enough should it cover sustainability should it cover cyber risk you know with the uh, current security environment with the russian war in Ukraine, do we need auditors to look at information security as well? The UK government didn't say, oh, let's do that. They said, let's let companies decide. They'll have to do an audit and insurance policy. The audit committee will have to look at that and they'll have to state what the scope of the audit is, where are their areas of higher risk, and has the auditor done extra additional work on those? Now, in Europe, they've already moved ahead because in the EU, there's a requirement for a second statutory audit, effectively. Um, corporate Social Responsibility Directive is going to require the auditor, or it could be another independent service provider, to go in and do an assessment of the sustainability reporting that's coming in Europe. So is the UK solution perhaps too conditional? Is it perhaps too complicated? Should we just follow what the EU are doing? That is perhaps a question we'll come back to in future years. So. ESG expectations, as I say, are going to be a real defining factor in the background to all this. Where do, what does that mean for auditors? In the EU, it's very clear. So if you're looking for a career in Ireland or in France or Germany, there is already going to be a massive ramp up in expertise needed to do this sustainability assurance. And I'm sure many UK auditors will be getting involved in this in one way or another. The EU has set low thresholds for UK companies. So if you do business in Europe of any scale, you may well get caught in this and have to do it anyway. Will some UK companies do it? There are also transition uh, plan disclosures. What is your net zero plan? How are you doing on that? How are you moving towards your net zero targets? UK government will be introducing those disclosures. No talk so far of there being an assurance requirement over that. But is the UK just going to do catch up at some point? point and then there'll be a whole load of new skills for auditors to to learn so it's certainly an area to watch and to learn as much as possible about now because if you're in audit you've not only got to learn about how to do a financial statements audit but you may also need or want to have those skills to understand sustainability assurance as well certainly there will be a lot of opportunities in this area whatever the track and pace of the uk government so finally, I'll just highlight three things. Resilience. Um, there will be a new resilience statement that companies will have to do. This is absolutely fundamental that at the core of all of the concern over the last um, few years has been the fact that there's a feeling company financial statements don't give a true depiction of the resilience of the business. That matters in terms of financial resilience. It also matters in terms of resilience to climate change and sustainability. Are we really giving proper information about the position of the, the business? And, and the evidence is there's more that needs to be done. Is enough being done to report on fraud risks? Again, this is going to be an area of focus. There's a new auditing standard coming. There's going to be a new report in the UK on fraud risks. But this is an area where we expect there's going to be more focus. And then finally, audit committees, we believe are going to be absolutely crucial in driving the sustainability transition. They will be in the line of sight for the new regulator. So what audit committees do, the role they play, controls within a business, overseeing the audit. There are a number of areas where the role of the audit committee is likely to be enhanced. So if you don't know anything at all about audit committees, it's probably a good opportunity to learn a little bit more about them because they will become more important. And 
as an auditor, you know, early in your careers, understanding what the audit committee does, how it operates, will be really useful because it will put a lot of things into context for you. So that's all from me, but very happy to answer questions later. Next on our list is Ian. Thank you, Ian. It's always a bit disconcerting when people leave the room when you're speaking. I guarantee you that's not because of anything I've said. So, um, so, so I was going to start this evening with a confession. Um, it was not my childhood dream to be an auditor. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, I'm going to come up with another one, which is um, actually I stopped being an auditor at the tail end of, um, of last year. So you're probably thinking, well, well, who is this guy and why has he been asked to come and speak to us about audit if it wasn't what he wanted to do and he's, he's just stopped doing it? Well, for 20 years I was an auditor and actually, like John said, I was very proud to be an auditor and I, I'm still very proud that that's um, been the, you know, the, 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 the foundation of my career in, in finance. Um, so I wanted to share a few things with you and there's a bit of repetition. So um, I'll try and get through it quickly because I really want you to be able to ask us some questions at the end as well. Um, so I'll talk a bit about how I, how I became an auditor. Um, I'll talk a bit about what I did um, and uh, my background's in the public sector. So I'll talk a bit about how some of what audit looks and feels like in the public sector is a bit different. Um, I'll talk about what I enjoyed, some of the things I learned, um, and I'll maybe throw in a few career highlights as well. Um, and then I'll do a, a few bits about the future and, and, and kind of where I, uh, well, where I see that going. But um, I think we're probably there's broad consensus in the room about some of the things that are coming on. So, so how did I become an auditor? Well, the truth is it sort of found me. Um, so I, uh, I did a history degree, um, I came out of university uh, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I wanted to work with public sector bodies, that was the thing that I was passionate about. Um, my mum had worked um, as an occupational therapist, i have been in and around sort of the NHS and local government uh, and seen the important work that, 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 that they did uh, and I thought, Do you know what, that's, that's something that I'd like to be, um, to be a part of. Um, so I took a job uh, whilst I was working at what I was do wanted to do. Uh, I took a job at my local city council in the housing department uh, and I had a brilliant boss and brilliant bosses and mentors are really, really important. Um, and if you've got someone who's going to give you the time and the benefit of their experience uh, and, uh, you know, and help you along the way, then, you know, don't turn them down because um, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I've had several mentors in my career um, and a lot of them are now my friends. So, um, so I think that's really, really important. So I was working in uh, Gloucester City Council Housing Department and I was loving it. It was a really good job. I uh, got to deal with people every day, um, but there was a sense that maybe there wasn't the opportunity for me to, to grow or to, you know, to, to you know, what did I want to do with my life um, other than being a housing assistant um, at Gloucester City Council. And, and my boss said, have you thought about the Audit Commission? And I said, no. And I went and had a look and I thought, actually, that's that looks great. And similar to what John was saying earlier, it, it was an opportunity to get a professional qualification, um, uh, an opportunity to uh, get a grounding in something that I was that I was passionate about. So I had 10 years at the Audit Commission and then uh, the, a certain politician called Eric Pickles decided to get rid of it. Um, and I moved to uh, I moved to Grant Thornton. Um, and I had 10 years at Grant Thornton and the last six of those I was a key audit partner. So John's a responsible individual, an RI, he signs Companies Act accounts. I was a key audit partner, I signed public sector accounts. So my last act, in fact, a, a career low light was the letter I got from ICAW telling me I'd been removed from the register once I resigned from Grant Thornton. Uh, there was a little bit of me that, um, that thought, oh, that, yeah, that hurt. But, um, but so, you know, the, one of the last acts I did as a key audit partner was I signed the, the opinion at the Met Police. Um, so that's about 3.8 billion quid. It's about a quarter of uh, the, what the UK spends on policing. Um, I also worked with large unitary councils, large London boroughs, work with smaller organisations, work with some really large uh, NHS organisations. Um, and, um, and part of what I enjoyed was getting the variety John talked about, so you to see how things work in different settings, um, see how things don't work in different settings, um, see how different parts of the public sector approach the same problems from different perspectives with varying degrees of success. But why is that all important? And I think it comes back to, again, what John said, it's about trust. 
audit is important because audit provides the basis on which people can trust what they're being told. Now, whether that's trust in a market or whether that's trust that the public pound is being spent appropriately, it's really, really about trust. And so I think the thing that's always, uh, the, one of the reasons why I stayed being an auditor is because I was working with organizations that I wanted to work with. So there was value for me in the organizations that I was working with, but there was huge value in what I was doing with those organizations, which was, I wouldn't say critical friend. I mean, it was critical at times, but challenging and supporting those organizations to make sure that they were being transparent, being open, that they were doing what they should be doing with public money and that they, um, you know, and that they were trying to improve and do the best that they can. So, so audit in the public sector is a little different. Uh, we do the true and fair view uh, on a set of financial statements, uh, but we also have some other responsibilities and have done for a, a number of a, a number of years. Um, so we have a broader set of assurances. In fact, I think the private sector is sort of catching up. Um, we, we have a broad set of assurances around what we're called arrangements for value for money. Um, and actually, that means that you're looking at more than the numbers. So audit for me has always been about more than the numbers. Um, so there's a piece there around financial resilience. So you're looking at how organizations plan, budget, uh, what are the risks to their medium-term financial position? How are those risks being mitigated? Uh, what's their track record? You know, what's the underlying resilience of the organization? There's a strand around governance and informed decision-making. How do they make decisions? How do they manage risk? How is that done uh, uh, on a you know, day-to-day basis within the organization? And a piece around, this is really snappily titled, um, Arrangements for Securing Economy Efficiency and Effectiveness in the Use of Resources. But that's about performance and continuous improvement and how organizations make sure that they're trying to make themselves better tomorrow than they were yesterday. So um, that's also just you know, was, was, was great for me because I got, to, uh, I got to do all the geeky number stuff, which I actually grew to love. But you also got to understand how organizations worked, how they ticked, and got to see that across, uh, across a, wide, uh, a wide variety of, uh, of settings. Um, it also and it also gives you tremendous access so some of the people that i got to speak to on a day-to-day basis from relatively early in my career you know so at the end of my career i was meeting the commissioner at the met twice a, uh, twice a year uh, was speaking to the deputy mayor of london uh, for policing and crime speaking to politicians speaking to chief execs speaking to directors of finance they're, they're people who uh who you know, just listening to their experience on a day-to-day basis is, is a tremendous privilege. And I also got to work with some tremendous, tremendous people in the teams that I worked with. Um, and I think, again, uh, people are so important. I think that one of the things I was told when I became a newly minted audit partner was, uh, one, there's no such thing as a perfect audit, in, and, and that's true. So you're just going to make sure you get the big things right. Um, and two, uh, you're only as good as the teams that you work with. So I was only able to do my job well if everybody around me was doing their job well. And I think, whilst that can sound scary, actually as a, as a, as a young professional, as someone going into a career for the first time, that level of responsibility can be really, really empowering. It, it can give you a confidence and it can give you a, a sense that what you're doing matters and that you have the backing of everybody in the team and the firm behind you to do your job and do it well. At Grant Thornton, we used to say, it's actually um, about doing what's right. It's not about always what's doing, not always doing the thing that's easy. So, uh, and I think some of uh, the other speakers have touched on that kind of the ethics and the integrity that the profession has. Uh, and again, I think that's something which, um, which I think is, is, is really, really important. So, so what else did I learn? Um, I think I've touched on the softer skills. I think some of those softer skills are really important. So I think I think for me, the technical bits were interesting, but it was much more about influencing, leading. Um, it's critical thinking. Audit is using judgment. You're using your, from right from the bottom to the top, everybody is exercising their judgment every day. It's about how you do that and how you do that with evidence that demonstrates why you think your judgment is the right one. Um, so some of those softer skills, some of those things that you'll learn as a career, you know, if you pursue a career in audit are, are invaluable. Um, it's a great way to become, you get a helicopter view. So I would often say, I'd often say you were a jack of all trades and master of none. I think actually you should say you're a jack of all trades and master of some. So, you know, you get a working understanding of a huge number of topics. So I know a disturbing amount about how highways are built and how they're valued. And I'm not sure how, 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 it, how practically, uh, uh, you know, how it is to, to, to practically apply that in life, but it's, it was interesting to me. Um, 
I also know an awful lot about um, how the NHS works, uh, how policing works, how local government uh, works. So all of those things, I think, are, are invaluable. Um, I think I talked about constructive challenge and support. Uh, it allows you to to um, to both. Uh, so I think when all it is done well, uh, and it does have to be done well, it does add value and it can make a difference. And I think uh, I can think of a number of points in my career where we we did something as a team or we took a decision, and actually the outcome that we delivered was better for the client and and actually better for the for the for the general public. Um, so a couple of other thoughts. ESG is just um, is is huge. The opportunity for that is huge. Uh, I'm not going to claim this one because it was described to me this way the other day. Uh, if you think about the amount of resource, uh, both human, technological, institutional resource that goes into collecting and reporting and assuring financial information, and you think about the amount of resource that will be required to do the same thing for non-financial information, we're, we're at the foothills of a new profession. Um, the good news is that all the skills that you will acquire as auditors are the ones that you'll need in that new profession because it is about asking a question and there is no such thing as a stupid question. Getting the evidence to support the answer to that question and deciding whether you're happy in your professional judgment that the evidence you've been given answers that question appropriately. And if you're not, you go back and ask again and you go back and ask again. And I think it's those skills which will be really, really important uh, as we move from, well, from what is uh, a system which has been with us for well, for millennia in terms of collecting financial information, and we move towards uh, collecting and reporting more non-financial financial information. And the exciting thing for me, if we do get to the promised land, and I don't know whether we'll get there in my career, but of integrated reporting from a public sector perspective, I think it's gonna it's it's a bit of a holy holy grail. It, it will allow us to demonstrate that um, that that actually the, the worth and the wealth of what we do, the value of what public sector organisations do, because it won't just be about the money. It will be about all the other things, all the other way those those, those organisations impact on society, uh, and uh, and being able to tell that story, I think, would be be really really powerful. Um, I'm going to stop there because uh, I'm really keen to let other people speak and I'm really keen to give you an opportunity uh, to, to ask some questions. But thank you very much for having me along this evening and uh, I hope you have some questions later. Thanks. Next, we have our very own Sultana. Um, Sultana was a very special student when she was at Queen Mary and of course now a special graduate for us. And given that today is International Women's Day, I feel even more proud to have Sultana in the audience. And um, and how could it in inspire you? Doing absolutely. Thank you. I remember a time ago that I was Sultana was sitting there and I was staring at her. Yes. Was it my body? Yeah. And did him, I knew that. And you did say in the future I'd like to come in. Yes. Yes, I did. Thank you. Sorry, I can be a bit loud. So if I am a bit loud, just let me know. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Sultana and I was a student here. I literally used to sit in one of those little chairs and my lecturers are here. And this is literally the space where I used to be just like you and just coming here. So, you know, I think someone was talking about corporate governance and my lecturer here, we used to talk about CSR and all of those um, stuff. So first of all, I just wanted to say Happy International Women's Day. Um, so to all the women here <laughs> representing <laughs> for the financial sector. Um, yeah, I think linking to the future of audit and the future of finance as well. For the fact that I'm standing here, someone like me is working right now in, you know, I work in the National Audit Office right now. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, but... I don't really like to say that because it's like, oh, why is the government doing that? Why are you guys not doing anything about that? And I was like, oh, we do recommend them. <laughs> it's for them to listen. But um, yeah, so I work at the National Audit Office right now and we primarily audit the government, the parliament, and I do some interesting audits with the United Nations as well, um, which are probably one of the most interesting ones in comparison with HMRC and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to say like that kind of future of audit, future of the financial sector, 
for someone like me to have that opportunity right now to stand here, even that is like a growth and that's something that everyone is going to speak about. And I hope they do about diversity and inclusion. It should be something and it is coming, especially even within my organization. They're really trying to hire more trainees that belong to that group, that belong to the ethnic minority group, because I don't know if that's PC to say, but the color is changing <laughs> and we should all be included. We should, we all have skills. We all have talents that we have to offer. And I definitely, definitely think that there is that scope for women, women of color to be there in the financial sector. Um, I don't know if people heard this, you know, brilliant panel, they talked about their years of experience. I don't have as much <laughs> experience in order. I've been, um, I think three years now and I graduated from Queen Mary at 2020. Um, so it's already been three years and I joined the workplace, um, during COVID times when everything was online. <laughs> So that whole entire year, I was doing auditing, just sitting in my room, just by myself. And I just thought, I don't know if this is the career for me, if this is the profession for me, I'm not too sure. But you know what? I think, you know, having that resilience, that ability to just stick through it, I just realized what potential we have as our generation. If we can get through something like the pandemic, and get through it and you know just realizing our potential gaining skills from it like people started baking during covid people thought you know what we're gonna use this time where everyone is suffering to do something creative and that's really inspiring that we want to learn something more we want to learn and i'm going to connect that to audio i think that's something really important and it is changing and that's the um you know this that initiative to learn to learn more to grow and to develop, um, you see that more and more because, so I also do like a ICW professional qualification at the minute, they're really hard, <coughs> but they're very, very rewarding as well. I think they open doors for you that you cannot imagine. Um, I think having that professional qualification on your CV or just talking about it or just yourself really feeling proud of yourself that you've accomplished something like, you know, the chart being a chartered accountant. Um, so yeah, it is tough. I'm going to tell you it is tough. You have to put in the hours, you have to be dedicated. You have to be very disciplined, especially when the exams are nearby. It's almost like a friend might text you, Hey, let's go for the night out or like, let's have a coffee. And you're like, I'm having a date with my books for today. <laughs> That's the kind of attitude that you probably should have during the exam time. Not not always, but during that exam period. But yeah, you have to be very, um, I think you have to put in the hours to achieve something like the SCA qualification or an SCA qualification because not everyone is going to be a child accountant. And you, if you want to stand out, you have to put the hard work in. Um so that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about to you from student to student, from like our generation to you. I think we often try to find the easier route, but you know, sometimes the easier route might not be the best option. You have to put your dedication, you have to put your hard work in it to achieve something much greater in life. Um, in terms of order itself, I think everyone just kind of mentioned about the technical terms and terminologies. So I'll tell you a very funny story. Um, I am getting married soon in May. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> uh, and then the other day, the, the, my partner's family came over to a house and I'll come from a very strict Bengali family, right? So my partner's family comes over and they're just like, so what do you do as a career? And I said, well, I'm an auditor. I'm like, what is that? Like everyone is just very curious around me, just gathering. And when I say everyone, you know, Bengali families, they're like very big. We had like 20 people in a very small room mushed together, looking at me, telling them what an auditor is. And I just go, well, you know, financial sector. And it's just like, pointless and I'm like well we're the financial police and we're like getting somewhere they're like oh right okay financial police okay okay and then <laughs> I still had some like doubtful people here and then I was like 
I am working towards a chartered account. Oh my God, chartered accounts. That's it. That's it. That's the one. That's it. The wedding sorted. You're in. Like, that's how. But I feel like with audit as a profession, communication is something that I think we do lack, especially where I work as a national note office. I feel like we do such amazing work, but we are really like not communicating well to the public what exactly we're doing. Even within the organization itself, it's like very hard to tell them what we do. And I think that's very like, I don't know, I feel like that's something that we can work on. How do we communicate to the day-to-day -day, like people, just like my family? What does an auditor do? What do we do? And, you know, that's, that's something that definitely I see that future in the audit where the younger generation can come in and explain that in a sort of easier language to say what audit is, what does an auditor do? Because it is very important work. Um, I was in the UN uh, in Geneva just in March and one of the audits that I was doing there is for the International Telecommunication Union. They've got very fancy names. So that's why they always use short forms like UN, ITU, PAHO and whatnot. So I was in one of their buildings and one of the directors, I wasn't, I didn't know that there was a director. She comes out of the lift, I'm in the lift with her. And then she was like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm this and that. Who are you? And I was like, well, we're the new auditors. Ronnie? Leo? Yeah? I wasn't was sure, like, what does she mean by you, like that? <laughs> and basically, she was like, well, the Italian auditors were very old, and they were all men. You, are you sure? You're not just making them the bill. I was like, no, I'm not, I definitely am. And I was like, yeah, I'm coming from the UK, I'm coming from the UK auditors. So like, she was like, that's amazing, that's brilliant. Come to the office, come to the office, I have so much to chat to you. You're so young, you look like a school kid. You <laughs> know? Um... But yeah, as I said, like, you know, you can see that times are changing, you know, young, more and more younger people, I feel like they are in that profession. And I think what we bring to the table is that sort of, don't be scared of us. Like, don't, we are friendly as well. We're, as auditors, when we walk into the room, it's not about just being scared of us. It's also about us getting as much information from them and them also benefiting from us. Uh, you know, as a client, we need to know a lot about them. So having that sort of client relationship and client communication is so, so, so important. And that's one of the personal skills, interpersonal skills that I picked up at Queen Mary, I feel like. Because um, I think the degree itself will give you that technical knowledge, but you need that external experience. So while you're here, please do, do grab those experiences because Queen Mary is a fantastic place to give you those opportunities. You've got the student ambassador role. I was the course rep for three years where I used to sit with Daishani, the program, like, you know, the program directors, uh, just, you know, you start so early on how to communicate with people that are way above your head, but how do you present to them issues that are ongoing within the university in such a manner that you are not disrespectful, but you can make your point come across. And I think as auditors, and I think the panel members mentioned as well, it's about using that interpersonal skill, that people skill to get what you want from them so that they're not scared of you, but at the same time, they don't take advantage of you. So that negotiation skills is so key when you go into that room and you're just trying to be like, you can't be very overtly nice. Then they're like, oh my God, I can take benefit of her. She's a young kid just coming in, probably lie one or two lies. And that's it. But at the same time, they know that what you were talking about is key. And, you know, you can't be taken um, as a joke. At the same time, you want to be come across as like a human. Because at the end of the day, that's what we are offering instead of the, technic the technical stuff that are coming through right now. So a lot of the things that they talked about, you know, technology, it's, I feel like it will be there, it's coming uh, ICW has included like data analytics in their software for the audit exams and it's something so um, embedded within the exams now that you see and I think it's useful it's useful in the sense that data is so big right now there's so much data out there and these tools will definitely help you to skim through and make the process faster however 
it's sort of like they will give you a number, but it's up to you as a person to interpret that as well as communicate that as efficiently as you can to the person in front of you. So if I take like a data sheet and, you know, talk about this to you guys, you will fall asleep in 10 minutes if I'm like, yeah, 10 million pound the government, yeah, 5 million in this and these expenses and whatnot. But what does that mean? You know, them expend, uh, you know, using that uh, budget for that expense. What does that mean? What does, what, what's the implication to you? So having that kind of skill, I think, just being able to analyze the data, but then you making the choice and you making that professional judgment, applying that professional skepticism that everyone talks about, um, and then sort of making it easy for the people that are in front of you to make them understand it's absolutely key. Um, so I think, yeah, technology is definitely advancing. It's one of the things that we are going to see in audit. But at the same time, I think people are at the heart of this audit that we talk about. People are at just the core of it. Because at the end of the day, it's you who's making that professional judgment and saying, yeah, maybe we are like 5% off, but, but there might be a reason why this is happening. There is an error, but it's not a material misstatement or it's not a huge error. So making that kind of you know judgment and decisions is very, very key. I think it starts even at the lower bottom as well. So I started as an assistant auditor at the National Light Office where I was just doing sample testing. Good old day sample testing is probably one of the best things. Um, but as you progress in your career, you make more and more and more sort of uh, critical decisions. So you have to make a bit more judgment. You know, you have to use a bit more for your judgment. And when you reach that level where, you know, majority of the panel are partner and directors, it's much more than that. So it's much more than looking at numbers. It's about looking at the market, looking at everything around you, the environment, which I'm going to talk about now. And I work very closely with the environment agency. So the group that I work in the National Light Office is the infrastructure group. Um, and I work very closely with DEFRA, the Department of Energy. Yes, exactly. You know better than I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we work very closely with them and we were working with environment agency about green rushing and carbon offsetting as well and things like that. So a lot of organizations will say, you know, we are we're green and this and that and stuff. But actually, when you look very in depth, it's not what they say it is. And that level of skepticism is going to have to come from you, from that curiosity. OK, they're saying that they're, you know, net zero and whatnot but what is it that they're doing to achieve that so having that question that curiosity always 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 asking questions i'm one of those people who enters the room and asks about 500 questions gets like a load of information from the client and then i think my manager just went to me and she was like what did you do how did you get her to talk about all of this and i said i started the conversation about deodorant and i just said you are smelling very nice <laughs> and that's how I started that conversation and yeah you're just just making them feel like home and they also sort of open up to you um but yeah just using that sort of interpersonal skills that I mentioned is absolutely key um but environment wise sustainability corporate governance they are all gonna play such a huge role um even within organizations because I was part of one of the panels at the NAO about carbon offsetting for ourselves. So we are working um, with the environment agency and they suggested that it might not be a good idea. So us as organizations as well, we are trying to learn and understand what the best option would be to achieve that net zero that everyone is after, that, that whole like climate environment friendly um, that we are talking about. And one of the things the organization is doing, for example, is limiting the printing of papers or, you know, your stationaries and things like that. that. That's just very tiny things that I'm talking about, just from a very, like, low level. So I think organizations are so much more aware of their impact uh, in the environment. Um, and I think I see that within audit as well. As auditors, we have to be careful about what organizations are saying and what they're actually doing. Um, so that's very, very important. Uh, I was just watching Clarkson's Farm the other day. I don't know how many people here watches that. Very, very controversial, that guy, right? 
Um, but yeah, it was just on the TV and they were talking about these forms about the, you know, the rural payment agency and stuff. And I was like, I know that form. I was sample testing the other day. I said, and that far, I know how, I know what he's talking about. It's very complicated. And some of the pages are very like useless as well. Like, honestly, but you know, just connecting that little dots. So people say audit is very boring, but it actually isn't because there's so many things that covers our life that I like as a job am connected to. For instance, um, I, re I read um, the Edward Snowden's biography and he used to talk about the ITU building and how he used to like, because he was a spy, right? He was an agent for the CIA. And um, they were just in front of that building. He was in front of the building. He was just trying to collect data from that and things like that. And I was just like, I am in the same building that he talked about in the book. <laughs> yes. It just like living that a book and then all this stuff. And I just thought, wow. But yeah, anyways, it's not it's not really just the point that I'm getting at is it's not a very boring profession. Um there are so many things that you can do, you can travel. Um, because I have traveled and I was I'm meant to travel to Washington DC soon for the Pan American Health Organization audit. Um which they you know they provide the south american all the medicines and things like that like just very interesting and very different to what i do as a day-to-day -day basis but there's just so much opportunity because you could be auditing an itv or w it's and rate then just be like why are your prices of the notebooks so high by the way <laughs> i really like them i will buy them but why are they so high <laughs> um but yeah, I just went to one of the uh, the ones uh, in ITU and I just said, well, so what do you do? The other, I just asked them randomly, what do you do? And they said, you know all the satellites that are in the sky? And I was like, yeah, we have to register them before they go up in the sky. And I thought, that's what they do. Nobody probably doesn't even know about it, but that's what they're doing. And then I looked at some of the lists and some that they work very closely with Elon Musk, Canada, and you know, these are this thing. And I just thought, that's really interesting, you know, and the fact that I'm in this profession where I can work in rural payment agency where we go and count cows. I actually did. I count cows, ships, and uh, did step on some poo at some point. Uh, it was fun. It, I did. I had a lot of steps on my watch that day. My Samsung company probably thought this girl does zero steps every day. Suddenly she did twenty k. Something is wrong. Is she running from her life or something? Um, but to be from like farms to an organization with the UN that, you know, register satellites and things like that. It's such a wide array of, exp sorry, experience. Um, so it's not boring. It's not boring if you don't want it to be boring because there are people within our organization who just sticks to the local government, but you can ask for that opportunity. So when I joined, I said, could I have traveling opportunity, for example, and you seek out that opportunity. You say, can I have that? Can I have this? If you don't ask, you'll never get. That's something that I've learned in my life. Um, so just to, just to say that, you know, is a boring job, I might not go into it. Why don't you try it, you know? Why don't you try? If you never try, you'll never know. That's something as well. I never thought I'd be in audit. Um, I think I should have introduced just one audit module at that time. And I really, really liked it. I enjoyed it a lot. I don't know what it was about it. Maybe because I always wanted to be like a spy agent or something. Or like a police, you know. And I thought, what's the safest way to do this kind of job? Audit. Behind a desk. That's it. That's what I thought. Um, but yeah, it just, you know, in terms of technicalities, I'm not going to go into it. I just wanted to talk like heart to heart from student to students. And also just to say... Something about myself, so I, I came in this country seven years ago, actually, from Bangladesh. Um, and I never thought that I would be here, standing here in this platform. And I met someone like Aishani, who gave me that opportunity. She kind of saw that, you know, I've got the potential. And she helped me go to this program in the UN. And then it, I felt like life came back to me 360, where I go and audit the UN now, where I was seeking opportunities to... You know, just have like a volunteering experience with them to the point where I go into those rooms and I can sit with them, ask questions to them. You know, this life is amazing. A lot of people try to feel like, you know, very sad and whatnot. And it's very easy to do that when you look at the news and there's so much happening in the world right now, you know, 
not audit related, but you know, there's so much happening in the world, like Turkey and the war and everything. And you can, it's so easy to just feel depressed and you don't want to do anything. You don't want to get up off your bed. But then again, there's so much opportunities out there, so much you can do, so much that you guys have to offer to the world as well. So please do grab the opportunities and thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, the room is a bit cold, isn't it, temperature? So I'm so sorry about that. We've um, When I came in first, I said, it's really cold here. They said, oh, heat is on, but it's still cold. I'm almost shivering there. So we have our final um, member tonight, and then we take a break and then come back um, to take questions. I am um, well aware of the time. We might even run a little bit later than we expected. If you're okay to stay, but um, question round, we can take it easy as long as we have uh, the, to give the opportunity for our final uh, member to speak. Thanks. Good evening. I have now got the hardest job not to repeat anything, right? Because many of you, um, you have heard the speakers here and most of the things would have covered, but maybe not because I'm going to slightly change the topic, not necessarily changing the audit because like John, I'm also a proud auditor. I didn't choose the profession. My my parents chose this profession for me. And why did what they did that was we are the family of auditors. So uh, my my dad was an auditor. My sister is an auditor. My wife is an auditor as well. So it, it seems that uh, we are, we, we, we have to love audit. And Many people said that audit is boring, but I say audit is cool. And the reason I say that is in the last uh, 25 years, I have never, I'll say, repeated any of the audit that I have done. So every couple of months, you get new things to do. You talk to new people, you learn about something new. So you're actually paid to learn things. So if you want to get paid to learn things, audit is a good profession. My son, who is nine years old, he asked me, I think, few weeks back we were talking about uh, why did you come late to home and I was talking about I, 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 was, I had work in my office and he asked me what do you do and I was thinking what to answer because he would not understand the word audit right so I, I said to him that I just get paid to ask questions so if you ask the right questions you are in the right profession if you want to learn things you are in the right profession uh, like John audit is one of the areas that helped me travel a lot as well. I traveled uh, to almost 20, 25 countries, uh, learned different exposure, ex cultures, etc. as well. So very, very rewarding career uh, since last 25 years now. Uh, I started my career back in India. Uh, my first half of my career was in India, working with organizations like Big Four, Oracle, uh, some of the financial services firms. And I moved to UK about 12 years back. Uh, primarily within the financial services. So worked with organizations like Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, and more recently Lloyds Banking Group. Uh, so my name is Vivek Jain. I am head of audit at Lloyds Banking Group. I look after their investments, pensions, and insurance business. And why I said in the start that I will be talking something different is most of my peers have talked about external audit, about audit that involves financial reporting and re uh, financial statements reporting. What I do is internal audit. And maybe a quick show of hands, how many of you know the difference between external audit and internal audit? A quick show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up. Oh, that's good. That makes my life easier. Uh, Lloyd's Banking Group, I'm sure uh, somebody told me, and I, I would not like to be quoted on that, but uh, Lloyd's Banking Group, for example, holds uh, one in four custom people in the UK have some relationship with Lloyd's Banking Group. So uh, hopefully about, we say about 25, 30 million people are connected to the, to the group. Uh, obviously we have to make sure that what the group does, what the banking industry does is fit for purpose, helpful for customers, making sure they are doing the right thing, not necessarily only the financial reporting, but also the day-to-day -day things. Because some of, some of uh, the speakers told, when we talk about stakeholders, our stakeholders are white. We are, the group is accountable to the public, to the customers like you. The group is accountable to the regulators. The group is accountable to the investors, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. There would be n number of regulations that they have to follow. 
I'm sure you will not be happy if your data is leaked. I'm sure if you'll not be happy if your internet banking is down for three days, et cetera, et cetera. So as an internal audit function, what we do is ensure that the management is doing the right thing for the customers. Ensure that they are complying with the regulatory requirements. Uh, just a quick guess, for example, I'm just taking my example of my organization as Lloyd's Banking. We have our own internal audit team, in-house internal audit team that takes care of some of these activities. Any guesses how many people in the internal audit team that we have? 10, okay. Let's go a little bit higher. Yeah, go ahead. 35, good, good, we are getting there. Anybody else? 50, okay, 15, okay. We are 300 people. Uh, uh, we are 300 people uh, in the internal audit team that looks after a uh, lot of areas of the bank, almost every area of the bank, right? Whether it is from your bank accounts, your credit cards, your insurance, your pension, your mortgages, how do they do these things? Their technology, the, how do they manage the data? How do they manage the infrastructure? What are their policies on crypto, blockchain, metaverse, et cetera, et cetera. So our job is not boring, it's cool. It takes, uh, you need to get, be ahead of the game as well because it's respected, it's valued. Uh, people, the senior management, the board, the audit committee you talked about, regulators value our opinion, which means that we have access to information, we have access to people. Many people in the organizations would not have that. For example, I uh, am part of the audit committee or board of directors. I represent there in, in, the, in, the, in the forums and committees for, so for example, Halifax Share Dealing, which is one of our stockbroking entity, to our general insurance business to talk about the business strategy. So not only about the financial statements, internal audit when we're talking about, is about what is their business strategy? How are they delivering it? What's their transformation program? If they are spending 100 million on implementing a new system, are they doing the right thing? Are they managing it right? Are they spending the money in the right way? Because ultimately, these are the, these are the things that will be impacting the business and as a result, impacting the performance of the business and possibly customer as well. For example, if they want to move to cloud, are they taking the right decisions? Uh, how are they making sure that the data is safe, the customer's data is safe before they are moving? Because they would have the inherent interest in moving things, et cetera. So we work as a gatekeeper. We work as a, a constructive partner, a check and challenge partner to really challenge them as to what they're doing is right. What they're doing is right for the customer, what they're doing is right for, from the regulatory perspective, and what they're doing is right from the investor's perspective. So a couple of things. I'll say where the future of the audit is. Now, future of the audit is beyond the, than the financial statements, beyond the financial statement in terms of we need to be aware of what's happening around us. We may not be a master of all, but we have to be knowing everything here and there. For example, you know how to operate the iPhone. You may not know how to build the app, right? But at least you know that when you click it, the app opens and you want to be safe. So at the same time, you need to know each and every subject. You need to know a little bit about what's coming in ESG. You need to understand what's happening in blockchain. You need to understand what's happening in metaverse. You need to understand what's happening in cyber, what's happening in the large digital programs, et cetera, et cetera. There will be people who will be specializing in each of these areas. However, as an auditor, you need to have a view of everything. So I did my chartered accountancy back in 2003. It is very well respected profession, uh, but I quickly moved into kind of a technology because I saw, the I saw the opportunity of mixing accounting and technology together. And that helped me in my career in the last 25 years as well, because you can understand business, you can understand technology that helps you, helps you succeed. So find your own thing in terms of what interests you. You can audit in almost every area. So it doesn't have to be that if you like accounting, you want to become an auditor. If you like any other thing, you can still become an auditor. If you like banking, you can become an auditor. If you like pharma, you can become an auditor, irrespective of which industry you are in, irrespective of which process you like. So whether you like uh, construction, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on whether if you want to learn new things, that's uh, going to be your job. So I'll just pause there now.
and uh, hand it over for asking any questions. Thank you so much, Vivek. Um, we've just decided something differently to do it, and um, Graham is going to announce. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. That that was really, really uh, interesting, and I, I think I might become an auditor. Um, I, I, maybe not. Um, but what we thought is there's 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 not that many of you, and there's quite a lot of speakers, and we thought thought if, you know we could get you to go out and come back, and we could sit everyone around here. But these people are here. Like you've got John to talk to. You've got, you know, Ian and, and everyone here. So we thought, well, let's just, it's quite cold in here as well. It might be warm outside. Is, is instead of having a panel, why don't you just, one of the things about auditors is they've got to be able to talk to people. So we, and it's supposed to be a networking event. So what we'd like you to do, if that's all right with the panelists, so rather than bring them out and sit them here and have mics going up and down, is, is just say, um, let's, let's mingle. Let's. Let's, let's, you know, and, and, you know, John, John will have to shoot off soon. And it just, if we, if, you know, if we can just have 10, 15 minutes, they'll all be here. Come and talk to them. You can come as a group and talk to them, talk to John about his career or a, any of the people here, you know, John, uh, about what's going to be in the syllabus soon, you know, but, you know, and, and Ian, but, but everyone, you know, and if you want a job at Lloyd's, Lloyd's banking group, I think you've got the man here who can get you the job. So um, they've got 300 people. They're probably looking for more people. Um, so I um, mean, he, he might have he might have summer placements. He said, seriously, do you have any placements or anything like that? You know, you could get a, a summer job with him, and then you could be in, you could be in Lloyd's. So and it just meant if if you did need to get away as well, you could. But if you want to talk to, you've got some real eminent people. They've all had fantastic careers in audit. You know, and you can see where they it's got them. They they've moved on. They've all done really well. Um, or you can get some real truth about the UN and what's really happening there, you know. So we thought rather than bringing everyone back and keep coming backwards and forwards, I've just said, let's let's just network. And, you know, there might be some food outside and some drink. And, and is that OK? We just thought you've, you've sat, you've done, you've done so well to just, yeah, please just start getting up. But you've done so well. And thank you. And so it's, it's just a big thank you, everyone, for coming. Well. And thank you. Let me just thank for all our speakers as well. They've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers as well. You've been brilliant. Yeah. So much also from us, from Queen Mary.